I'm joined uh, on the panel uh, by my colleague at the World Economic Forum, uh, Marisol Argueta, who is the head of Latin America, and she has been the person uh, principally responsible for organizing this uh, summit here in Medellin this week. In addition, sitting on her left is Eric Parado, who's superintendent of banks and financial institutions in Chile, and we expect to be joined uh, in a moment by uh, President uh, Luis Alberto Moreno of the Inter-American Development Bank. What I'd like to do uh, before engaging my colleagues in a discussion is just to provide a couple of uh, comments about uh, the significance of what uh, we're announcing here today. The, the World Economic Forum has been uh, engaged in an exercise on gender parity. It's an initiative that we've been doing for the last uh, several years, which involves uh, a leading piece of benchmarking analysis that helps to analyze how countries are doing along various parameters of gender parity, comparing them with each other by a series of metrics. But then in addition to that, uh, about four years ago, we launched four pilot action-oriented task forces, gender parity task forces, in uh, four countries around the world, which is uh, Mexico, uh, Turkey, uh, among uh, other countries where we've been uh, active uh, over the years. I will talk about them in a, in a little bit more detail during the course of the panel. But uh, what I'd like to do is just to indicate that we have uh, released here today a uh, report that looks back on this work uh, which is uh, continuing in one of the four countries, uh, the Republic of Korea, but it has wrapped up uh, in the other uh, three countries and uh, distilled some lessons uh, from those uh, experiences. Let me just briefly characterize them for purposes of uh, the discussion here today. Uh, these are, are countries where educational attainment is relatively high in terms of a low uh, gap in gender, but the the gender gap on economic participation is relatively high, so that there is what we think of as a economic efficiency and inclusion gap in these countries, because the female uh, workforce is highly educated, but not yet fully integrated into the economic activity of the country. And so these task forces each have assembled a high-level public-private coalition of actors from the government, from the private sector, but also from civil society and sometimes the thought leaders in a concerted effort to set some targets, to mutually uh, agree upon some action steps that they will collectively be held accountable for and monitor over a period of years. And they have all set a target of reducing that economic participation a gap by uh, 10%. Uh, each of them made significant uh, progress uh, over the last uh, three years or so. Turkey closed the gap by about 11%. Uh, Japan by 6%, Mexico by 1.5%, and Korea, which has a year left, is at about 9% uh, or so. Uh, there are a few lessons which I'll draw out maybe a little bit later in the conversation, but the other element that's significant today is that looking forward, we are announcing a partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank to begin to apply this uh, model, this multi-stakeholder task force model of organizing progress within a country uh, in Latin America. And the first country where the IADB, with the support of the forum, will be uh, applying this model will be, in fact, uh, uh, Chile. And we're very delighted uh, for that cooperation and very happy to have the superintendent of banks here uh, to discuss that. So without any further delay, why don't I invite uh, my colleague, uh, Marisol, Argueta to offer her reflections and then we'll move to you, uh, Superintendent. Margaret. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. This is indeed a very critical topic for Latin America and for the rest of the world. A, until 2015, Latin America had closed its gender gap to se in 70%. The third after North America and Africa, and Europe, sorry, and uh, Central Asia, the third region in terms of overall gender gap a closing. The, one of the two sub-indexes where Latin America performed better was healthcare and education. Among the three top performers, we find Nicaragua, Bolivia, and Barbados. In half of the working women, the women in working age are in the lab for, lab, labor force all of them still earn less than men. 
And what shall we do about that other 50% that is at a working age, but not yet accessing labor forces? This is the way it, where the forum, the IDB, and the government or of Chile are planning to work on so that we can enable a better access for women in terms of participation in the labor force, in terms of salary eh, equality, and also in terms of improving the labor standards for women, which is another very critical factor, not only for women to access the labor force, but to enable women to remain in the labor force. The um, aspect of informality is another aspect that is of great concern through Latin America and the quality of work that, that women have access to. There's three areas where the forum has proposed some recommendations to address these uh, inefficiencies or this important challenges, and these are the creation of adequate policies to promote access of women in working place, the improvement of access to childcare, and also to support women entrepreneur. We need to have the creation of an ecosystem that enable and facilitates women uh, to develop it, it, it's their own capacities. So I think we have three important proposals, which will be part of the work that we will be uh, launching with uh, the IDB and the government of Chile. And I will leave my friend Eric Parado and fellow YGL to provide us with some more specific information on what it is expected in Chile. Thanks very Thank much, uh, Marisol. We welcome uh, President Moreno of the Inter-American Development here, but first uh, let us turn to you, uh, Superintendent Parado, for your thoughts. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> it's an honor to be here. Uh, I, I want to be part of the solution and not the problem, so I'm representing here the efforts by the Chilean authorities to close the gender gap in some way or another. When I talk about gender gaps, I would like to um, recall a quote by Michael Kimmel, which, who says, privilege is invisible for those who have it. And I think men, um, we have the privilege to, to have certain um, rights that women don't. So that's why I try to put the concept of conscious bias, because conscious bias it has to be in favor of women because regularly we have unconscious bias uh, against women. That's why it's important to be part of the solution, that all we have to make the change, together with the World Economic Forum, together with the IDB, together with the government of Chile, and of course, the superintendency of banks and financial institutions, we can be part of this effort to close the gender gap. In the case of Chile, the gender gap in wages is about 30%, so which is, which is too bad. And in terms of labor participation, the difference is also striking. Labor participation in the case of men is, is more than 70%, and in the case of women, it's, not, it's under 50%. So if you don't believe in fairness, if you don't believe in justice, because I hope you, you believe, but if you, you, if you don't believe in that, Remember that we're losing money if women do not participate in the labor markets. There are some estimations in terms of the cost of losing uh, talent in the case of women, around 50% in the case of the OECD countries. So that's why it's not only a moral imperative, but it's an economic necessity to make that change. So that's why Chile is right now part of this solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. President Moreno. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rick. It's a pleasure to be here. And, you know, beyond what the Superintendent Parral was saying and, and Marisol and, and Rick, let me just say that there's like a paradox in Latin America in terms of advances in, ge in, in gender equality. Certainly, there's been a lot of progress. Uh, one of the most relevant ones, of course, is the participation of women in politics. I often uh, mention what President Bachelet 
said about women in politics, she says, when a woman participates in politics, it changes the women. When many women participate in politics, it changes the politics. And, and I think this is really where it all begins, because certainly there are dimensions that are regulatory, what the Superintendent Parrada was talking, all of the data demonstrates. The similar tendencies that you see around the world in terms of gaps uh, for, the, for uh, remuneration to women workers in the same levels of responsibility, for the lack of women participation in more businesses. We, for instance, have seen analysis uh, a recent study that was done uh, that demonstrates out of 350 companies around Latin America, those that had women in their boards or in their executive committees had better results than those that didn't uh, by large numbers. But I think that the largest question I think is a very important issue uh, that I think we all need to put a focus on is what happens to women behind closed doors in Latin America. And when I say behind closed doors, I mean the level of violence against women that exists, uh, the many cases that are never reported. We have countries like Bolivia where one out of every two women uh, suffer some form of domestic violence. And I think these are the kinds of things that in a country like Chile with the program that we're doing, we ought to highlight at the same time that we're talking about empowerment of women on the economic front. So yes, we have a lot of progress that we should feel proud of, but we need this fundamental cultural change that will be the, the, what is needed, I think, to be, bring the big structural changes that are needed in our region. And we certainly know that this is an economic imperative. Uh, I mean, all of the data demonstrates the ones that have been done by the World Economic Forum, done by institutions like ours, and equally by McKinsey, the huge impact, economically speaking, uh, uh, that, you know, women's participation in the labor force can have. So with that, I'm very happy to celebrate this and happy to be here with, with Rick and Marisol because this is a, a, a labor of, of, of responsibility, of love, and very much in line with the principles of the forum uh, to advance this agenda uh, throughout the world and especially in the Americas and Chile. It's a great uh, possibility to do that, especially with President Bachelet, who was, as we all know, the first director of UN Women and who did a great work in that space. Thanks very much. Just before opening it up uh, for questions, let me give people a sense of the learnings from these four task forces that are moving from analysis into action and trying to get a society to mobilize. One was uh, to state very clearly the economic case for the country, but also for the companies. Secondly, is to share the objectives, the targets, publicly. So it's not just a club doing it, but it's really socialized more widely, so there's a sense of uh, responsibility and accountability to society. Uh, third is to make the objectives measurable so the progress can be tracked. Which, what's, what's distinctive about these task forces is that they, they surveyed midstream how progress was going within some of the firms and the other institutions, and then they were accountable at the end of the three or four year period for how well they did against the 10% improvement uh, target. Fourth is that they were structured to withstand the political and business cycle. We know that ministers and CEOs uh, cycle, uh, and they, but this is a long-term effort in society if you want to make progress. So in addition to having very high-level people, the, each of these task forces had a wider ecosystem of actors from, from different parts of society involved that would lend a sense of continuity. Fifth is within that ecosystem, build a wider base than just the business and the governments. The, the religious community, journalists, et cetera, academics, can be a very important element of the, of the equation. And last, um, engage in some cross-organizational learning. We found, interestingly, that some of the most interesting um, uh, dynamic of the process was when we got competitors in the same industry to talk together and agree on what might be good and productive in their sector. And that, uh, that can be very, very helpful. Let me pause there and then open it up for uh, any questions. Please just identify uh, yourself and uh, your institution. Hello, my name is, I know, I know this is on, okay, I think so. Hello, my name is, 
from here. And one of the things that I have found is that the challenges for women are very different depending of the of where you born. So if you were born in a golden well, in a golden bed for saying so, it's very different for having no bed. So are these policies differentiated? Because for highly skilled women, they are worried about not having children for not advancing in their careers. But in the lowest, in the slums, they have 10, 15 children. So there, there are different challenges. Are they differentiated? these policies that you're proposing as the IDV, as the World Economic Forum, that you're now working together? The, the set of metrics that are used to uh, track progress have different facets to it. Some of them are workforce related, some of them have to do with the uh, gender parity and the other institutions like politics, but some of them go very much to what you're talking about is the health and educational context and what, to what extent there's a a, a gap, a gender gap there. So, so yes, this is a, these are very explicit considerations in determining strategies going forward in these exercises. Yes. I, I would just, if, sure. if I may, yes. just add one very, very brief comment. But from what I have also perceived in, in America is that sometimes challenging backgrounds also produce very thriving characters. And I have seen, in particular, among the shapers, many very remarkable young women that have come from very difficult uh, or lower uh, social economic extracts that have had access and have, uh, through a lot of effort, have uh, studied in very, very top universities in the United States and in Europe. And what is very interesting is that the ones that I have met have decided to come back to their countries. So they also uh, become role models and a great inspiration for other women. Yes, sir. Um, my name is Igor Torrico. Soy periodista del my name is Igor Torrico. I am from the newspaper of Medellin. The, is this initiative, what will be the amount of the, the investment amount of this initiative? Besides Chile, what other nations are thinking to be involved in this initiative? Yeah. In terms of what resources will be uh, invested, what, what's important to understand is that this is not a traditional development assistance approach, if I could say it. It's, it's not a grant of aid uh, for government programs, per se. Rather, what this is, is a multi-stakeholder series of collective interlocking commitments. And so the resources that are expended tend to be in the form of policies and activities that particularly companies agree to undertake, and that they they resource as part of their core business strategy, if you will. Now, yes, I imagine there may be some uh, NGO and governmental complementary actions through programs and whatnot, but uh, that comes out of the strategy setting process in the task force rather than coming from some sort of a, a line item in a budget, some public uh, part of uh, a public institution or whatnot. Other questions or comments? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Good morning. My name is Yolanda Londoño, and I am with the Tupperware Brands Corporation. And we have a robust participation in the space dealing with women's economic empowerment. Uh, we have representation from our CEO at the World Economics Forum Gender Parity Conversation. He is also part of the uh, Private Sector Leaders Advisory Council with UN Women. And of course, members of He for She promoting the uh, the movement and the 10 by 10 by 10. So we are deeply vested. And one of the things that we know, both from a company and a corporate standpoint, which we're trying to follow the guidance that you are putting together in um, looking at our own company policies and 
pay, e equity, et cetera. That's one area that we're working on. So your guidance will be greatly appreciated because we're trying to find out what metrics to, um, to really apply to this audit of our own gender equality status as a company. But secondly, we also know that um, economic empowerment is a transformational tool for those women who are born perhaps without that bed or without that income. When women receive a meaningful way of making and contributing financially, all of a sudden, all of those male-centric um, traditions and attitudes and the violence recedes. So how can we, in a company like ours that has deep roots, almost three million women in about 60 countries, how can we begin to instill in these women the information and the tools that you are creating at this high level so that between the high level where you sit and the grassroots where we have the opportunity to work, we deliver the messages that are important for women to understand and we get the men in their lives involved in that respect and in that partnership. The most successful members of our sales team are couples. And that is a transformational way of shifting that paradigm of violence and sort of cycle of, of poverty that exists among many women. So um, just like to let you know that we're ready. We are vested and very happy to uh, be a partner with you, whether it's in Chile or anywhere else that you decide. To. We have members in Korea as well, Japan, um, and the countries that you have um, mentioned. So we're, uh, I'd just like for you to think of how can we take that message down in a more meaningful way. Thanks. Well, I think that's a, a great way to put into action what we're trying to do here, because at the end of the day, is how you channel these things into the wider population. You have a reach through you know, the kind of mass marketing that you do and the, um, the system of, of, of layering of, of markets that you have uh, that you know, putting to practice a lot of the efforts that we're going to do here, and Chile is a great example to begin there. Uh, you know, I, I, I always remind people that, you know, Latin American economies, if you had more gender parity, could add up to about another trillion dollars of economic growth. So this is not just a, a, a make-feel-good kind of a, a effort that we're trying to do. It has real economic uh, consequences, and this is why... Uh, we spend a lot of time, and one of the ways that, that we can work with you is uh, in what we have been doing as a bank to directly focus on women entrepreneurs, especially at the level that you're suggesting. So, for instance, in Brazil, uh, Hema Sacristan, who is here with us, uh, who runs uh, a good part of our private sector arm of the bank, uh, we provided a guarantee to one of the major banks in, in Brazil uh, that allow them to raise another $500 million uh, solely to uh, reach women entrepreneurs. Because the other factor here, of course, uh, in this space for in, in women empowerment is access to finance. And so these are the kinds of things that we need partnerships to be able to really channel those resources down. And we're happy to, I'll put you in contact with Hema, who is here. And we can, well, this is topper where Hema, you see that you just came in. So how we can work together. Very good. Well, thank you uh, all. Uh, particularly uh, thanks uh, to President Moreno, Superintendent Barrado, my colleague Mary Saul. This is an important new stage in the gender parity work uh, internationally, I believe, and we wish you very well with the task force in Chile. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Rick. Thank you.